Dutch troops attached to the 2nd U.S. Division advance south of Inja. Netherlands units pass wrecked ROK equipment as they smash back at the red penetration below Inja. From a hilltop, machine guns open up on a small house harboring enemy troops. Communist prisoners are taken as the Dutch move down into the valley. The red salient below the parallel is rapidly contained by UN pressure from three sides. A red soldier with a gangrenous wound in his leg is carried from a battered house to be given medical treatment. The enemy, who last week broke through ROK elements in this sector of the Eastern Front, is rolled back with heavy losses of men and equipment during the period 28 May to 4 June. The troops press on against the Reds, who hold another hill beyond the valley. Quadruple-mounted 50-caliber machine guns throw a hail of steel into the enemy hill position. With the main communist force routed from the hill, the Dutch soldiers move in to mop up possible stragglers. The men pause in their pursuit of the withdrawing Reds to have a warm meal brought up in Marmite cans. The advance continues as the Netherlands unit, pushing up from the south, drives the last of the Red force back across the 38th parallel, east of Inja. On the ground near his truck. Artillery crews service their guns as this second division unit temporarily isolated from its supplies by a washed out bridge, faces the enemy on three sides. The UN force runs low on ammo as the Reds fight desperately to hold open the escape route between Inja and the East Coast. In spite of their precarious position, the men maintain spirits while waiting for ammo. Next day, near the 23rd Infantry CP, General Edward W. Alman, 10th Corps Commander, arrives to confer with 2nd Division officers. An airlift of artillery ammunition is ordered, flying boxcars wing north on the mission. A break in the weather allows resupply by air, once considered an emergency measure, but which has now become a routine logistical operation. With their ammunition stores replenished by the airlift, the hard-pressed UN force is able to hold its position at Inja. However, the delay caused by the torrential rains and strong enemy counterattacks allows a great part of the communist force below the parallel to escape north between Inja and Kansung. Flight after flight of cargo planes, which have been dubbed by the soldiers flying A-frames, comes in over the drop zone to release the vitally needed ammunition. Anchored to a tank on shore, a ponton bridge is rushed into service across the swollen Soyang River below Inja to reopen the supply routes to the north. Tied to a cleat on the tank, a heavy cable holds the ponton floats from being washed downstream by the swift current. Vehicles cross the floating span to bring supplies up to the Inja battlefront. Although hampered by the rains, the 8th Army keeps rolling and by the end of the first week in June has eliminated all red salients below. On the Seoul airstrip, F-51 Mustang fighter planes are readied for a combat mission against Chinese defenses in the Korean hills. While the planes are being loaded with rocket and napalm persuaders, the members of the fighter group finish their briefing and leave the operations hut. Heavy weather is the report for the day, but the pilots of the Mustangs keep to their schedule of combat missions. Streaking through the sheet of water covering the strip, the F-51s take off for the north to rout the red troops from their hill positions. Blazing 
rockets find their targets. Napalm bombs add their fury to mark another effective sortie by the Far East Air Force against the Communists. Its mission accomplished, the F-51 squadron comes back to its base for splash landings on the water-covered runway. As one pilot climbs out of the cockpit, a brother flyer circles an enemy flak hole in the plane, one that came a little too close for comfort. On 4 June, UN forces begin strong, coordinated attacks against Red troops fighting from well-dug-in defense positions. The pursuit phase of the Allied counteroffensive is declared complete. In the West Central sector, a UN task force fights through Yanjan and pushes forward to within 12 miles of the Communist Triangular Stronghold anchored at Chorwan, Kumhua, and Pyongyang. In the center, advances are made around both sides of the Huachan Reservoir. On the eastern front, the Reds are engaged north of Inja and below Kansong. The Allies are now back at the line they held before the unsuccessful Red Spring Offensive. Monsoon rains drench the battlefield and hamper UN air activity. At the Navy Submarine Training School at New London, Connecticut, students learn the ropes on undersea craft. Here, enlisted trainees in the eight-week course march to class at Gilmore Hall, named in honor of Commander Gilmore, who in World War II, although lying badly wounded on the exterior deck of his submarine, ordered his crew to take her down to save the sub from the enemy. At the ship handling trainer, students are taught proper docking procedures through the use of miniature models. The submarine school trains all enlisted and officer personnel of the Navy submarine service. At the attack trainer, a periscope rises from a tile floor. Students below practice sighting on ship models which move across the make-believe ocean under electronic control. The New London installation, one of the oldest sub-bases in the U.S. Navy, is commanded by Captain Charles Treble, who is also Commander Submarines Atlantic Fleet. Out in the dock area, a specially designed vehicle brings two submarine torpedoes out to a sub preparing for a training run. Cranes lift the huge steel fish to the sub's deck from where they are lowered into the underwater craft. With students aboard, the vessel gets underway. The trainees get the feel of the small bridge on the ship's conning tower as the craft moves down the Thames River toward Long Island Sound. The order to dive sends the men scurrying below. Slowly, the underwater craft slips beneath the surface in a practice dive. Students who complete the training course at New London are entitled to wear, over the left breast pocket, the dolphin insignia of the Navy's elite silent service and qualify for incentive pay. The big sub glides below the surface until only its periscope is visible. Below decks, the crew of a submarine lives on intimate terms with the snub-nosed torpedoes and the intricate mechanism of their craft. An excellent mess, however, helps to compensate for the cramped porters. With the practice dive finished, the submarine breaks the surface to head back up the Thames to New London. At the base, a sub is moved into dry dock for a periodic overhaul. 
Complete facilities are available at New London for all phases of submarine training. At Schleswig-Lahn, Germany, General of the Army Dwight D. Eisenhower inspects an honor guard composed of occupational troops of a Danish reconnaissance squadron and Norwegian cycle ski troops. Then, as a Danish engineer unit goes to work building a ponton bridge, the general sees the principles of the North Atlantic Treaty being implemented by the Mutual Defense Assistance Program. The MDAP provides the materials, the armaments, and the technical know-how through which the freedom-loving countries are banding together to resist aggression. In a combined exercise, Danish and Norwegian soldiers demonstrate their battle prowess while the supreme commander of the Allied forces in Europe watches from a nearby hilltop. two Scandinavian countries, charter members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, recognize the spread of communism in Europe as a threat to their security. With the assistance of the United States and other members of the NATO, they are taking action to forestall that threat. Although possessing manpower and strong defensive positions, the 12 North Atlantic Treaty countries were weak in armament when they signed the charter and pledged themselves to action in case of an attack against any one of them. The armament necessary to bolster that pledge is now being provided. The importance of naval power in Western Europe's defense has not been overlooked. General Eisenhower goes aboard the destroyer Willemose as part of his tour of inspection. Everything is ship-shape as the general makes his way around the destroyer. And a neatly executed parting salute. After his inspection of the land and sea defenses of the two Scandinavian countries, General Eisenhower continues his tour for a look at the air situation. Norse airmen of a jet squadron taxi British vampire jets across the airfield for a demonstration flight. These British planes, together with American F-84E Thunder jets, will constitute a formidable defensive air force for the countries of Norway and Denmark. It is planned to send expert observers from the Danish, Norwegian, and other Allied air forces in Europe for a month's study of the large-scale use of jet planes in the Korean conflict. On the next lap of his Scandinavian inspection tour, the general goes aboard the Arendal, a destroyer escort of the Norwegian Navy. The Arendal hoists anchor and takes off, foam billowing in its wake. Destination, Fort Horton, historic Norwegian naval base. General Eisenhower transfers to the small craft which will take him ashore. On shore, a car is waiting to drive the general to the port, which protects Oslo Harbor just 11 miles away. At Fort Horton, built in 1851, General Eisenhower pauses briefly for a view of the shipyard and the harbor, where the new blends with the old. Modern ships and weapons for the united front against aggression before a background of ancient, time-honored walls. Back at his car, General Eisenhower is greeted by townspeople of Horton. Then he meets Olaf Rolf, an 82-year-old pensioned U.S. Navy veteran who comes from a nearby town to volunteer his services for the free, strong Western Europe now emerging under the MDAP. By 
by 18 June, United Nations forces, after smashing through the enemy's Iron Triangle in the Central Mountains, meet increasing red resistance in this vital area, but surge forward to the east and west. In the western sector, Allied troops sweep across the Imjin River north of Korang Po and force the withdrawal of red forces beyond the parallel, but meet strong resistance north of Yan Chan. In the sharply contested central sector, the UN drive toward Kumsan is slowed by ominous buildups of communist troops and artillery. In the east, the 8th Army gains ground beyond Inja. As the red defenses stiffen in the center and communist reinforcements pour down from the north, General Van Fleet warns his commanders that the enemy may be preparing to launch another offensive.